one's ever liked a video before I've even gone live, I think. Right, you have got until I have boiled this kettle to have a little go at the stars question. And then we'll get going. Because my new amazing method of setting up the video beforehand means that uh, you're already here. This is so good. So much better, isn't it, than when you just had to hang around refreshing, not knowing if I was live somewhere else. Right. Have you got all your stuff? Have you got your Lego or your Duplo or your Oxo cubes? <laughs> Um, if you're bringing ice cubes and doing that with me, don't get them out just yet. Keep them in the freezer if you can. There we go. <laughs> yeah, so you'll start a question. This is, I'm really happy with this one. Some of you might know this already, because a lot of you are real like animal enthusiasts and done a lot of research, but are penguins suited to life at the North Pole? Explain your answer, that's the most important bit. If you don't know, then I'm really pleased, because obviously I want to teach you it. If you don't know, you have got time to just write down your answer. Just yes or no, and then why you think penguins are or are not suited to life at the South Pole. Right, my kettle has boiled. So I'm going to bring my kettle over and then flip you around. Just done a Lego story time on Facebook in a Lego story time show about buffalo. And I, if I start singing halfway through about where buffalo roam, then forgive me. Okay, right. I'm going to flip you. You ready to be flipped? <laughs> Hello. Hello, Science Alliance. I am Lara. I am your science teacher. Uh, you are the Science Alliance. Welcome. So today is our, it's our fifth ecosystem lesson, isn't it? It's our second to last one. So we're doing uh, adaptions today, mainly animal adaptions. We're doing one plant adaption, okay, right at the end. Sorry, plant fans. Um, next week, we're going to look at how you count animals, why scientists do this, like how do you find out if something's endangered or not. Um, and then we've got two weeks off for Easter. And then after that, we're going to start a whole new topic on waves, which I'm very excited about because I'm a physics teacher. But anyway, we're looking at animal adaptions today. Um, what are animal adaptions, first of all? So if you and a fungus and a piece of fruit all got into a time machine and went back in time one and a half billion years you would come out and you would find that the earth was covered in stuff that you were all related to you would meet your great 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 etc a million grandparents and they'd just be one cell big and this was life on earth and then about one and a half billion years ago these little cells Obviously, they were reproducing, all living things reproduce, sort of having babies, if you like. Um, they had babies and had babies, and they started to kind of change and grow depending on what their environment was like. They became better suited to, to their environment and eventually evolved into fruit and mould and humans and trees and all kinds of different life on Earth. Um, so that's what we're talking about. We're talking about how all the different living things on Earth are specifically suited to survive in their environment. The first thing I'm going to do, uh, yeah, I will do it now. A lot of you have seen me do this already, so I didn't say to bring it with you, but I'm going to pour a very, 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 you can see this is nearly boiling, mug of water into a bowl, a very wide, thin bowl, and then I'm going to fill that mug up again. We did this really recently, didn't we? but we need to do it again for reasons which I will explain. <clears throat> so the first thing we're going to talk about when it comes to how animals have adapted is surface area, right? This comes up a lot, especially if you're going to do a biology GCSE, they always end up talking about surface area. What a surface area is, especially in biology, is just 
kind of the amount of the living thing that is on the outside. So the surface area of this margarine tub is like all the sides of the margarine tub and the lid and the bottom that are kind of in contact with the air, right? On the outside. The inside of the margarine tub, that is not the surface area. That's what surface area is. Um, if you've brought six bricks with you, I've got Duplo, but even if it's Oxo cubes or just any kind of toy brick, it doesn't need to fit together. Can you please <clears throat> arrange the bricks, kind of thinking about surface area, can you arrange the bricks on the table or the floor or whatever in a way that you think <clears throat> would be useful uh, for an animal's foot to look like if it was a swimmer? That was quite a complicated sentence, wasn't it? Imagine that these bricks are making up an animal's foot. All the bricks have to be in touch with each other because obviously otherwise bits of the foot would have like come off and that's gross. You've got to make all the bricks touch each other, but arrange the bricks in such a way that it would be helpful for the animal to swim. So the bricks are the animal's foot. Am I, have I said foot and animal and brick enough for you to understand what I want you to do? Put the bricks on the table. <coughs> Imagine that they are your animal's foot and your animal needs to be good at swimming in order to survive. What will your animal's foot look like? Right, we're starting off simple, then we're going to get harder. So I think I've done it. I mean, you quite often will step in and tell me ways that I can be better, but I think, I think this is it. Have you done it? I've just got this. Just a rectangle of bricks. Is, did, is that what you did? Really good for pushing through the water. So loads of animals have adapted to be better at swimming by having um, feet that have quite a big surface area. For example, I got in trouble the other day for saying that this was gross. Obviously it's not gross, it's gorgeous. These are up to penguins' feet. <laughs> and you can see that they've got claws, like a perching bird has three claws to make it good at perching. But the penguin has evolved and adapted to have webbed feet. So it, it's got more surface area, right? So it's better for pushing against the water. Here is one in action using its little webbed feet for swimming. Fabulous. Okay, so little puzzle for you. Can you think of another animal, another environment where it would be useful for an animal to have feet like this? Can you think of a, another animal or another situation where it would be useful for an animal to have feet that had a really big surface area like that? Useful for swimming, because it can, it can push down on lots of water, so it can propel itself through the water better than if it just had like feet like this. It wouldn't be as good at swimming. Um, yeah, there's another one. Some of them got this on Facebook the other day. It is an animal that lived in snow, right? So you know how people put their like snowshoes on that have got a really big surface area so they don't sink, in, sink into the snow? Meet the snowshoe hare. It does what it says on the tin. That's why it's called the snowshoe hare. So it's got much bigger feet than a traditional hare that doesn't live in the Arctic. Um, so yeah, it's important to remember that the animals haven't kind of chosen to be like this. What it was was there would have been hare in the Arctic that had small feet and found it quite difficult to move in the snow and they were more likely to get eaten by their predators. Um, and if a hare happened to be born with slightly bigger feet, it only needed to have like slightly bigger feet than all the other hares to be more likely to survive because it was going to be the one that was most likely to get away. So eventually hares with bigger feet were surviving, hares with smaller feet were dying, so the bigger feeted hares bred with each other and bred with each other and had babies and, and passed those traits on, okay? Um, so now all snowshares have big feet. Right, your second brick puzzle, can you arrange the bricks in such a way that the maximum surface area is touching the air, okay? Arrange your bricks in such a way that the most of the outside of the brick is touching the air. As much of the outside of the brick as possible is touching the air. So this shape wouldn't work because you've got quite a lot of surface area then touching the table. So that's not good. How are you going to do it? I definitely got this very wrong the first time. It's only when you start to actually do it and think of it out loud that you work it out. So I, I've done a very poor show. I'll show you what I had done while you're thinking and doing it. I'll give you five seconds. Bad teaching to just pull out one. Got to let you do it. Have you done it? Arrange your bricks. Don't forget they've got to be touching because this is part of an animal. Can't just be like bits floating around. Arrange your bricks so that maximum surface area is touching the air. This is what I did first of all. And then I looked at it, I was like, oh no, that's totally wrong. What? Because quite a lot of surface area is touching the table. I'll put them up like that, I thought. Yeah, that's better. 
Now less surface area is touching the table and more surface of the bread. And then I thought, wait, no, that's ridiculous. I should have done this. And I think I've cracked it now. I think that's the way, isn't it? Because then only the very smallest side of, the, of one brick is touching the table and all the rest is sticking out into the air. So well done if you did that. I think that's the best way. Um, <laughs> it's okay, we don't, oh no, we do need those. No. An animal that uses this is the gecko. This idea of having an enormous surface area. If you've been to a country where geckos live, you might have seen them clean to the ceiling of hotels. This is all cute. Here's another picture, just for cuteness. This is all... So you might think that they are sticky because they really can just walk across ceilings like it's nothing. Um, they are not in fact sticky. What they have done is what they have evolved to be like is they've got loads of tiny little hairs on their feet. And even those hairs have evolved to have tiny little hair-like things coming off them. As Alice said on Facebook, they've got hairs on their hairs for absolute maximum surface area. If you came to our periodic table lessons last term, um, you know that sometimes particles can be attracted to each other. So the particles in the gecko's hand are attracted to the particles in the wall. So to, to get enough attraction, enough sort of force of attraction for them to stick, they just need loads of bits of their hand I don't know, to be in touch with the wall. So that's why they've got all these little tabby says. Okay, right. Um, let's have a chat about volume, okay? Because if you do, you don't have to, you might not, you know, but I haven't actually, but if you do uh, GCSE biology, then you will start to hear about volume and surface area being used together. Volume just means how much space a thing takes up. All right, so the volume of this brick is just how much space the brick is taking up. You can't change the volume of these bricks. However you rearrange these bricks, the bricks will always have the same volume, all right? Because they're always taking up like the same amount of space in the air. Can you arrange these bricks though, so that they've got the smallest surface area possible? Arrange these bricks so that maximum surface area of the brick is like in inside, if you know what I mean. Cover it up. You want as little brick as possible on the outside. I think I've got this one. No one's corrected me so far. There we go. You can maybe hear stacking, which is a clue. Minimum surface area we want now, as little surface exposed as possible. Five, four, three, two, one. Have you just kind of clagged them all together like this? Yes. So. If you, I won't go into it too much because it is quite confusing and it's GCSE level, but um, we talk when we talk about animal adaptions about this thing called surface area to volume ratio, which basically means like how much surface area there is per certain amount of volume. So this shape here has got a very, very low surface area to volume ratio. There's not much surface area per volume. This shape where we lined them all up, it still had the same volume, it was still taking up the same amount of space, but it had a really big surface area, right? So that had quite a big surface area to volume ratio. <laughs> so why was I pouring boiling water into plates and bowls at the start? Well, the reason is, different animals have different surface area to volume ratios, uh, and a lot of that is to do with how they keep cool or how they stay warm. So come down here with me. You know what I'm gonna say, don't you, right? Both of these waters here in the mug and in the plate have got the same volume, yeah? It's the same amount of water taking up the same amount of space in each one. But this one on the plate has a huge surface area and this one in the mug has quite a little surface area, right? And if I dip my finger in, don't try this. I did make you try this at home, didn't I, the other day? Oh, that's lovely. I mean, that's nice. That's like bath temperature. And you saw me pour them at the same time. If I stick my finger in this one, it's really painful. That's just, don't do that. It really hurts. Um, the plate has cooled down fastest. Now, this is a biology lesson, not a physics lesson, so we won't go too much into why. But, um, but yes, big surface area basically means that heat can escape more easily. So, oh, I threw my bricks away. Um, the warmest shape that you can get then is like the opposite of a plate. It's a sphere. <laughs> if you are a living thing and you want to stay really, really warm, the best thing to do is be a sphere because then you've got the least surface area possible. So not as much heat is escaping. Obviously, if you put that volume into like a shape like this, that's a lot of surface area. That thing is going to get colder. So elephants though, what's an elephant do? An elephant is basically a sphere with legs, isn't it? But elephants live in very hot countries. So how do they stay cool? I think a lot of you can know this. Three seconds. How do elephants stay cool, even though they're basically spheres? 
which is a very warm shape. Um, it's their ears, isn't it? Yeah, I've got a picture, because who doesn't want to see a picture of an elephant? Look, it's, a, it's basically a sphere, very, very hot, but it's got huge ears, which you can see, they're very, very thin, and they've got a really big surface area, so they, they lose heat very easily for the elephant. Also, apparently, they just waft them around. They just flap them like, uh, like fans. So curling up into a ball or being a sphere is the best way to keep warm, on the other hand. Uh, obviously, cats know this. So let's talk a little bit about uh, how things stay warm. Have you got some ice cubes and about half a tablespoon of butter or margarine and something to wipe the butter off your hand with? I'm going to get my ice cubes now. Do, 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 do. Two, three, Live action science happening. I'm back. What you've got to do, you don't have to do this, obviously. Some people really don't like getting sticky, do they? If you do not like getting sticky, this is not the activity for you, my friend. But if you don't mind, what you do is you put about half a tablespoon of butter onto one of your hands and you make uh, a butter cup. <laughs> yeah, just like pat down the butter. I'm quite glad there's no comments on this because when I did this on Facebook, there were a lot of just, what? <laughs> uh, make a butter cup in your hand, cup full of butter. There we go. Um, and then all you have to do is get two ice cubes. Obviously for fairness reasons, it's better if they're the same size and I'm gonna put the same surface area of ice cube facing downwards onto both my hands. And you just stand or sit with your arms out with one ice cube sitting on your bare palm and one ice cube sitting on the butter and you have to see which one it's called. It's don't be a hero, don't be a hero. When it gets too cold, just put it down. As soon as one of them gets too cold, put it down. That's what you for, ah. Ah. So the ice cube that is just on your skin, you will find very quickly, becomes unbearable. Um, that's because the ice cube is melting and it's taking heat from your hand to do that. Heat energy is passing from your hand to the ice cube. So you're losing heat energy, very much so, and it really hurts. But you'll find that the one with the butter is actually pretty comfy. Like, I could do this all day, this is fine. So this is a very good model for how blubber works. Blubber often gets called a layer of fat. It's not actually a layer of fat, um, but it's very similar to fat. And it, a lot of animals uh, who live in the very far north or south have this layer of very thick blubber on them uh, to keep them warm. So here is a Weddell seal. Uh, there we go. Which lives in Antarctica. I've got a photo. I like this photo because I feel like it's the kind of photo that I would have taken, you know? It's not too fancy. It's just, wow, I am near some Weddell seals. Here's a close up. The, you might think that it looks like it's dead. No, this thing's just chilling. It's just having a little snooze. Isn't that incredible? Um, because it's got such a thick layer of blubber. So Weddell seals can get up to about 600 kilograms and the blubber weighs about 250 kilograms. It's about two inches thick. So it's just, it's like me with my ice cube on my butter right now. It's just not feeding anything. Here's a picture of a cub because, hello. Um, the whale with the thickest blubber is the bowhead whale. Here it is. Again, here's a lovely image. I just like to imagine that I took this picture. This is a bowhead whale breaching out of the ocean. This one lives up north in the Arctic Ocean. There's its gorgeous tail. So yeah, bowhead whales have a lot of blubber, um, seals have blubber, some penguins have blubber, and polar bears have blubber as well. There we go. There's a picture of a polar bear for you. Right, come back up here. I'm going to have to take this butter off my hand, I suppose, aren't I? I'm kind of, <laughs> kind of enjoying the feeling. <laughs> Um, so yeah, blubber's really useful because it keeps animals warm. Um, it's an insulator, you would say, in physics, so it doesn't allow heat energy to pass through it. So the, the ice cube can't steal the heat from your hand. But blubber, um, it also acts as like a, a sort of store of fat. So polar bears, other animals can go for quite a long time uh, without eating if necessary because they just burn their blubber to get energy. Uh, and also, happily, it floats as well. It's buoyant, so it really helps the polar bear to... Um, you know, swim around, doesn't have to get very tired keeping holding its head above water using all its muscles because it's actually got a, like a life jacket on under its skin. Um, obviously the polar bear has also adapted to have very warm fur. So polar bears and brown bears used to actually be the same animal. Hats off to Chloe who taught me this the other day. Um, they were the same animal and then apparently, they're not quite sure, maybe 400,000 years ago, um, there was not very much food 
brown bears went off in search of food. Some of them got stranded on glaciers near the North Pole. And obviously a lot of them died, but some of them that maybe just happened to have slightly paler fur, so they were camouflaged slightly thicker fur, um, they survived and they slowly evolved into polar bears. But yeah, polar bears, I don't, don't think, haven't actually been around that long. That's why polar bears and brown bears can breed. Anyway, right, let's get rid of the butter and <laughs> talk about something else. Um, that has segued us quite nicely into camouflage. So while I go and wipe this butter off, I would like you to answer the question, please. Ah, some people just joining us live. That's nice. If you've just joined us live, then yeah, get stuck in. Well done. Stay around. <laughs> you haven't missed anything. Why are snowshoe hairs white? Why are snowshoe hairs white? It's, it's not a trick question. Sort of question that's like dead easy to answer and then you answer it in an exam and then you don't get any marks and you're like, ugh, what? Anyway, we're not teaching to the exam here, so don't need to worry about that. Why are snowshoe hares that live in the Arctic, where it is snowy, why are they white? Why is it helpful for them to be white? Why are they more likely to survive? Kind of answered the question, but come on, Lara. Uh, the answer is, I'm sure you got this, they're less likely to be seen by predators who want to eat them. If you were doing a GCSE question on this, you might say, um, paler hares are more likely to survive, so that trait got passed to their offspring. Yeah, so just like we talked about. Um, a hare is born, it's slightly paler, so it's less likely to get spotted, so it's less likely to get eaten, so it mates with other hares that are around that are also more likely to be pale, so it makes paler hares, so eventually you get this beautiful white hair. All right then, so my next question. Why are polar bears white though? Because polar bears, why are they camouflaged against anything? They don't need to be camouflaged, there is nothing hunting them, they're at the top of their food chain. Why are polar bears white? I'll give you 10 seconds while I mop water off my desk. Five, four, sorry, three, two, one. Uh, well, they're less likely to be seen by prey who want to run away from them if they are white. So again, in GCSE language, uh, paler bears are more likely to get enough to eat because they can sneak up on their prey. So they're more likely to survive. So that trait got passed on to their offspring. All right, very quickly, I just told you that a sphere, being a sphere was a really good way to keep warm. Why aren't polar bears spheres then? Hmm? Why isn't a polar bear a sphere shape? Wouldn't that make perfect sense? It would be the best way to keep warm. Five, four, ridiculous questions I'm asking you today. Three, why isn't a polar bear a sphere? Why isn't a whale a sphere? Very warm shape. Two, one, uh, yeah, it's not a very good swimming shape, is it? I mean, a whale is basically a sphere, isn't it? Like, with a tail, biology with Lara. There you go, it's my picture of a whale. Um, so there has to be some compromise. A polar bear that was a sphere would keep very warm, but it wouldn't be very likely to swim fast through the water and catch seals and things that it wanted to eat. So, so all these adaptions we're talking about are compromises. Right, just before we move on, Let's talk about why uh, tigers are orange, because it is my favourite science fact. And I've learned a lot of them over the years, but why tigers are orange is my absolute all-time favourite science fact. If you've got a red pen and a white piece of paper, then we will just do this now. Um, because tigers live in forests, right? Tigers are sneaking up on animals in the forests. Why would being bright orange help? Well, get a piece of white paper and a red pen and just draw a sort of dot on the white paper. What you've got to do for this is you've got to just stare without blinking at the red dot for as long as you can without blinking. For me, it's about three seconds. Stare at the red dot for as long as you can without blinking. And then as soon as you can't take it anymore, look at the white piece of paper and see what you see. Just in case any of you don't have a white, a red pen. Yeah, got to make these lessons accessible. I'm going to hold it up to the screen like that, is that okay? And I've got a red dot on my side, so I'm gonna stare at it for as long as possible. You ready? Without blinking, just do lots of blinking, warm up, three, two, one, stare. Oh my goodness, I wanna blink so hard. Oh my goodness, I can't do it. No, keep staring, keep staring. It's better if you keep staring for as long as possible. Ah, oh, I blinked, look at the white paper. What do you see? If you're much better at this than me, what you should see if you stare for long enough and then look at the white paper is like a bluey green blob. That's because, a lot of physics in this biology lesson, at the back of your eyes are three different cells that detect colour. There's a cell that detects red light, 
one that detects green light and one that detects the yellow light. And basically the whole time you're staring at the red dot, the red cells are getting really tired. Like, why am I the only one doing any work around here? So when you look at the white paper, obviously the white paper is sending all the colours of the rainbow into your eye, red, green, yellow, blue. We'll talk about this when we talk about waves in a couple of weeks. Um, but your red cells are tired, so they're taking a break. So they're not picking out the red of the paper. So overall, the paper looks more like bluey green. Um, the prey of tigers, like deer and whatnot, that are living in the forest that the tiger's trying to creep up on, they've basically sort of got the equivalent of what humans would call colour blindness. So when they look at something that is really orange, they see green. Oh, it's such a good fact. So you can't get green fur. You, it's just an animal cannot have green fur. There's one green sloth, but it's actually covered in algae like a plant. It's not actually green fur. It's just a biology thing. Um, so the tiger has evolved to be orange because it's still covered. It's just, anyway, it's, it's calm down. We need to move on. It's such a good fact. Okay, um, moving on then. I'm going to give you another little puzzle here. I have some animals here uh, that are all keeping warm in their cold climates and one of them is the odd one out, okay? They've, they've all got some blubber, I should say, so it's not that. <clears throat> Here are some cold climate animals keeping warm. You've got a polar bear from the North Pole, the Arctic. You've got a Weddell seal and pup from Antarctica down south. You've got huddled penguin chicks, they're also down south. And you've got an orca, which is found all over the place. Which one is the odd one out, given what we've just discussed? And why do you think that? There's loads of people on Facebook enthusiastically giving me just a word. And I'm like, eh, that's fine, I don't understand what I mean. I don't really care if you're right or not. I care about what is your thinking doing? Like, how are you, how are you reasoning? I'd much rather see someone get a wrong answer, but their thinking is really good and they've really thought it through. Which one of those is the odd one out? Oh, this mug of water is just a perfect temperature for drinking that. Hmm. Have you decided? Have you told me why? Hmm? The answer is, um, it's the penguins that are the odd one out. And the reason I've said the penguins are the odd one out is because they are keeping warm uh, using behaviour. So you can get different types of adaption. There's what we call structural adaption, which is what we've looked at, like maybe being camouflaged or having really thick warm fur or a layer of blubber or whatever, something about the body that has changed and adapted. But behaviour can also be an adaption. So penguins do huddle to keep warm, uh, which is obviously a behavioural thing. If you came to the stick insect show we did with the Lego story time, uh, we learned that stick insects are not only camouflaged to look like sticks so that they don't get eaten, but they also, I can't talk about it without doing it, they also sway from side to side. Come on, do the stick and stick dance with me, you know you want to. Um, yeah, it's called crypsis, just a way of avoiding predators. So this is a, a behaviour um, which goes along with their camouflage. Which, so I guess stick insects that weren't swaying, even though they looked like sticks, they were more likely to get eaten because looking like a stick is more realistic if you're moving around. Anyway, so yes, here's another little puzzle for you. Why? Could you walk right up to a Weddell seal? I mean, don't, but why could you walk right up to a Weddell seal? But if you got within six, uh, 90 meters of a ringed seal, it would run away. Why could you walk right up to a Weddell seal, but you can't walk up to a ringed seal? I'll give you a clue. Weddell seals live in Antarctica and ringed seals live in the Arctic. I'll give you 10 seconds. I'm quite pleased with this question. Again, some of you just know, but hopefully some of you won't. <laughs> I, I want to teach you waves. I bet none of you have looked up electromagnetic waves in your own time. Okay, so the answer is why you can walk right up to a Weddell seal is because they don't really have any predators on land. Whereas ringed seals, bless them, they've got loads of predators in the Arctic and they have learned to be very wary. Um, so in Antarctica, down south, like the, the biggest land creature is like a fly. Very few creatures live 
inland in Antarctica. Um, so the Weddell seal, like if it goes into the water, it could get eaten by an orca or a leopard seal, but actually on what we call fast ice, where the ice isn't going anywhere, um, it's totally chill. It just hasn't evolved to have any kind of nervy behavior because it doesn't need it. Whereas the ring seal can't just chill out on the ice because it would get eaten by, you know, polar bear or wolf or whatever other scary camouflaged creatures are hiding in the Arctic. Um, so yes, this is another example of how behavior um, is an adaption. Right, I've done an awful lot of talking and we've done loads of activities. So it's time for you to do a little bit of uh, sort of thinking in our summary activity. First of all, I'm gonna use something which is kind of you remembering, and then I'm gonna show you something which is more you applying your knowledge. It's not a very long activity. I've got a picture here of a snowshoe hare. Uh, can you label parts of the snowshoe hare to explain how it is adapted to survive in the Arctic. If you are on Facebook, you might have done, or you can go to my Facebook group for these lessons and uh, download the free optional worksheet. So if you've got the worksheet, obviously you can label it on the picture. If you haven't, it doesn't matter, that it just sketch a terrible and fast sketch of a hair and then label it to talk about how it is adapted to survive in the Arctic. You don't need to know anything about hairs for this, just using what we've learned today or what you can see in the picture. I've given you a clue. It's cold and there are other animals trying to hunt it. So what adaptions would it need to uh, survive in those conditions? Quick scribble, quick! Can you get two that are to do with it surviving the cold and two that are to do with it surviving uh, predators? drinking the bowl of water and it's cold and it tastes a little bit like margarine there. All right, so what I got, you might have got other ones, uh, uh, it's got long, big ears, right? Good hearing to escape predators. Uh, it's got fur to keep it warm, it's a good one. Uh, it's got big feet to move more easily through the snow, well done if you remember that, and it can run fast, right? It's got like powerful muscly legs to escape from predators, and I've missed one out, which one have I missed out? It's white, it's camouflaged, isn't it? So well done if you got all those. So fur and, um, well, some of them are both, aren't they? Like fur, um, having big feet helps it survive in a cold place, but it also helps it survive predators. Okay, so the next one, which you haven't learned about, because I'm hoping that you can apply your knowledge, is a giraffe. Can you jot down very quickly how this giraffe has adapted to survive in its environment? Again, it's better actually if you don't know anything about giraffes. I'm not testing how much you know about giraffes. I'm testing, uh, or checking rather, how like you can apply what you have learned this lesson to a new situation. Because obviously there are certain ways that giraffes have evolved. Um, but you should, even if you didn't know anything about them before, be able to get a few. Okay, I'm going to go through it. What did I get? Um, I've got patterned coat for camouflage. It's good, isn't it? It's clever. So it kind of, it just kind of breaks it up. So there's not a big giraffe shaped blob on the horizon that a lion can see. Uh, they've got big ears, again, to, to hear predators, because the giraffe is a prey animal. It is trying to get away from things. It's got long legs for running away. Very well done if you said it lives in a hot country, doesn't it? Uh, so it's got thin legs and a thin neck. That means that it's got a very big surface area to help it stay cool. That was a really good one. Well done if you got that. Uh, and yes, obviously, it has got a very long neck, which allows it to reach leaves on trees so it gets food to survive, but it also allows it to see predators from very far away. Right, I've got four, maybe that's too many, but I've got four puzzles for you now to end the lesson on. Four, yeah, four mysteries <laughs> that I'm wondering if you can solve to do with adaptions. Because um, like I say, some of you will know this already. Some of you will have just looked this up because you love cool animal facts. But I'm thinking if I give you four puzzles, there's bound to be one in there you didn't actually know. Um, so yeah, four puzzles. We'll go through the answers to the puzzles, and then that is the end of the lesson. Are you ready? Here we go. Puzzle number one. 
Why did a study show that holly leaves are more prickly on the bottom 2.5 metres of the tree? Why? Because holly trees can get quite big. But why are they more prickly on the lowest 2.5 metres of the tree? How do snowshoe hares avoid being seen in spring and summer when the snow melts? So I have a picture here of a hare standing out an absolute mile against some grass. How does it survive in that situation? Question three. Are penguins adapted to live at the South Pole? So I asked you this at the very beginning. I'm going to have to close in on this map because that is a clue. Are penguins adapted to live at the South Pole? So this is Antarctica here, this big blob of white. And right, almost right in the middle, is this orange star. That's where the South Pole is. Are penguins adapted to live at the South Pole? Uh, and question four. Imagine that an animal needs to store lots of fat on its body to use for energy, like a polar bear does, but it lives in a hot country. Can you sketch what it might look like? So basically, an animal wants to have blubber, but it lives in a hot country. What are you going to do? If, how might that animal have evolved? I'm going to quickly draw some pictures on... <laughs> picture is a bit generous. I'm going to scribble on the board. And then I'll go through the answer. Where seldom is heard a discouraging word, and skies not cloudy or grey. Home, home on the range, where the deer. Right, I've drawn my picture. Have you come up with some suggestions? Have you, have you sketched? Sketch for your lives! Come on, quickly, finish that fourth sketch. I don't, know, I don't know why I'm rushing you. I'm rushing the people that are watching live. Obviously, if you're watching this recorded, you could just pause it and work for as long as you like on this. Okay, I'm going to flip you around though. So, question number one. It differs in different places, but scientists did uh, study holly trees. I don't know why I've drawn a Christmas tree. And they found out that holly tree leaves are much, much smoother on the top of the tree and spikier on the lower 2.5 metres. Because 2.5 metres is almost exactly as high as red deer can reach. And deer are eating the holly leaves. Um, so they don't need to be spiky at the top. They have adapted to be spiky where they get eaten to stop predators eating them. More likely to survive. It's good, isn't it? Um, how snowshoe hares avoid being eaten when it's spring and summertime and there's no snow is they change colour. A lot of you knew this already. So they're white in the wintertime and then it takes them about 10 days to get brown coats. So obviously they're a bit vulnerable in that time. Apparently climate change means that there is less snow on the ground uh, for more of the year. So they are, they are, I think a lot of them are adapting and are becoming browner for longer because obviously the ones that haven't adapted. Um, are penguins adapted to live at the South Pole? Again, if you didn't know this, I'm delighted that I get to give you this kind of mean puzzle fact. No, they're not. So this is a map of Antarctica, sort of like a weird tadpole, and the South Pole is here. The South Pole is about 750 miles away from the edge of Antarctica. Um, so penguins just haven't evolved to be able to make that journey. Look at their little webbed feet. They can't do it. They can't get that far. And if they did get that far, when they arrived at the South Pole, there wouldn't be anything for them to eat because penguins eat fish. So penguins actually live on the coast of Antarctica. Penguins do not live at the South Pole. They do obviously travel inland, some of them, uh, to, to lay their eggs, but they don't travel that far inland. And if you were going to sketch an animal that wanted to have blubber so that it could survive off the blubber, but it didn't want to stay very warm, uh, then you might have sketched something like this. Camel in it, that's what camels are doing. Um, isn't that good? So it's, it's got a hump where it stores fat so that it can get energy. But look, the rest of it's got a really big surface area, hasn't it? Very thin legs and neck so that it stays cool. I know. They've got long eyelashes, quite famously, to stop sand getting in their eyes. And they've well done if you gave your animal big hooves as well for walking on sand. Um, and you might have also, if you knew about animals, you could have drawn an animal with a very big long tail, uh, which stored its fat in its tail. There are many different ways that animals that live in hot countries stay cool and keep their fat. All right, you lot. Whew. 
That was a lot of activities and a lot of talking. That is the end of our adaptions lesson. Thank you for coming. Like I say, we've got another lesson next week on how you count animals. Um, if you do want to do GCSE biology, then actually the practical that we're doing in that lesson is pretty much a GCSE practical, so that'd be interesting for you. Um, and then, yeah, two weeks off for the Easter holidays when I parent my own kids. And then uh, we're going to start on our waves topic. I'm so excited about it. I get to teach you waves. We're going to look at sound waves rainbows like the waves the earthquakes give off we're gonna get out uh, magnifying glasses and candles and look at making cool doing cool tricks it's gonna be very fun so i'm very excited about that um i'm just having a look at my facebook page to see if any of you have left me any comments if you are watching live what oh my goodness there's loads of comments oh look there's joe and emma and there's um izzy b and bella apparently color blindness is color confusion Colour blindness is the most known one. Really? I did not know that. Camouflage? Oh, well done. Oh, you're giving me loads of answers. Brilliant. Uh, oh, good. Sonia and Mum have found it. Hello, Bella and Mum and Dad. Oh, that's so nice. Lovely. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, Bella has, uh, has got a picture of her age three cells old. And I have shown that on Facebook. I should say... And then most of you are supporting me and I feel bad about bagging on about it, but really I do want this to be my job, it's the best job ever. And, and to do my job I have to earn money. <laughs> so if you do happen to be new and you don't know how my business model works, it's awesome. Everything I do is free and um, if you support me with five pounds a month, which a lot of people are doing, I'll send you nice things to say thank you because five pounds a month is all I need to keep going. Oh, hello Suki and Oz, Aza and Eunice and Salah. Hello. <laughs> they don't want to bounce. No, that's true. A spherical animal would probably be quite bouncy. They live at the coast. Oh, you're getting this. Oh, it's Joe and Emma. Right. Weddell seals don't live, th oh, don't live all that long because they wear their teeth down so much, keeping ice holes open. I did not know this. Hello, Joe and Emma. That's a very cool fact. Stuart's on now. <laughs> child restrictions on his laptop. Child restrictions. Oh, well. Hello, Stuart. Yeah, well done for finding the incognito tab. Ah, oh, Brandon's here as well. Brilliant. Oh, long tongue to reach leaves. That's a very good giraffe fact. Do you know that why giraffe tongues are slightly purple as well? Because in, in nature, the purple pigment is uh, quite often it protects from sun. So like purple plants have evolved to be purple because maybe they evolved in places that were so sunny that they would actually get too much sunlight and it would damage their leaves. So purple is basically sunscreen in the natural world. Prey don't see orange. Nice. Hello, Laurie. Good to see you. Polar bears and white so they could sneak off and prey. Wow, this is great. I'm just getting a flood of excellent answers. Polar, polar bear skin, it's back. Is it World Bear Day today? No. <laughs> Bella, you know perfectly well that I did not plan that, but let's pretend that I did. Oh, Bray is watching live as well. Hello, Bray. Oh, nice. Oh, and you two got desert and snow. Very nice. Oh, that's so lovely to see all your comments. Thank you for that. Great. Okay. Thank you for all your support. Um, when you sign up, I send you Theatre Science Magazine. I write a, a magazine every so often. If you sign up now, I'll send you the rainbow glasses and, the, and a past issue in like a welcome pack. But the new magazine is about to come out. So if you sign up now, you'll get the welcome pack as usual. And then very quickly after that, uh, you'll get my latest Theatre Science magazine, which is all about sleep. It's a beautiful comic as usual. Thank you, husband. And there's some activity ideas. And I, I'm going to post you some fabric and some lavender so that you can make your own little sleep squish help you sleep at night thank you very much for all your support uh yeah if you want to support me it's kind of a buy one get one free deal at the moment so now's a good time you'll find the link to coffee in the about section which is on youtube somewhere thank you for coming here lot uh i'm doing the lego story time show about buffalo at two o'clock on youtube if you're having a science day and you want to come back in now in 15 minutes other than that i'll see you next week bye stab stabbing the not awkward at all <laughs>